Good morning again. We start in two minutes. Good morning again. We are resuming session of the symposium number four on um, species um, data and visualization uh, information. So uh, we open this second part of the session with a presentation by uh, Manuel Vargas and co-authors. We have a, a recorded presentation for it. presentation will be in Spanish with uh, English subtitles. Hola, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es William Mulati y junto a María Auxiliadora Mora y Manuel Vargas, queremos presentarles nuestra experiencia compartiendo información de especies en un portal de Living Atlas mediante el estándar Plinian Core. Los Living Atlases o Atlas de Biodiversidad son una comunidad de desarrolladores y organizaciones creada alrededor de la plataforma desarrollada por el proyecto de Atlas of Living Australia o ALA. ALA, en español le llamamos, incluye un conjunto de módulos de código abierto y reutilizables diseñados para construir portales de biodiversidad. Hoy en día, más de 27 portales de biodiversidad institucionales o nacionales que han sido implementados con las herramientas de ALA están en constante desarrollo y mejoran su código fuente como parte de las actividades de la comunidad. También se comparten experiencias, se brinda soporte, talleres y materiales de entrenamiento. Por otro lado, el Plan es una especificación general orientada a compartir descripciones y nomenclatura, así como muchos otros aspectos legales de conservación y detalles de manejo, entre otros, de la información a nivel de especie, tanto fuentes tanto locales, como regionales. No vamos a entrar en detalle aquí sobre la historia del estándar y vamos a puntualizar los términos ya incluidos, pues esto se fue mencionado en esta misma conferencia por nuestro colega Francisco Pando durante el simposio del pasado martes. Solo diremos que luego de más de 15 años en desarrollo, el estándar cuenta con múltiples implementaciones en diversos países y ha sido revisado y formalizado siguiendo las especificaciones de TAPI para ratificarlo como estándar. Una de las herramientas más utilizadas para compartir datos de biodiversidad estandarizados es la herramienta de publicación integrada de GBIF, conocida como IPT, por sus siglas en inglés. El IPT es una aplicación web de código abierto que permite a las instituciones estandarizar, publicar y compartir datos de biodiversidad a través de los portales Living Atlas, GBIF y otras redes de biodiversidad. Esta herramienta simplifica el proceso de publicación de tipos de base, de datos base, como por ejemplo las listas de taxones, y permite asociarles información adicional utilizando extensiones ratificadas. Algo muy importante es que en este momento las extensiones no ratificadas solo pueden accederse a través de un IPT mm. en modo prueba, lo que limita su publicación. La información 
conservación de especies es uno de los tipos de información más buscados por el público general. Muchas organizaciones utilizan páginas de especie que contienen descripciones morfológicas, mm. distribución, hábitat, estado de conservación, manejo, eh, nomenclatura y multimedios. Estas se pueden publicar entonces como Darwin Core a través del IPT, como mencionamos, de nuevo en modo prueba, usando el taxón como núcleo y las extensiones que GBIF mantiene en su repositorio. Como parte de nuestro proyecto, procesamos ejemplos de información de especies de plantas de Brasil y Costa Rica, utilizando las extensiones del Plian Core en una instalación IPT en modo prueba y creamos un archivo Darwin Core para uh -huh. mostrar cómo pueden ser utilizadas por las instituciones que quieren publicar sus páginas de especies. Este año, con la asistencia del programa de apoyo al mejoramiento de capacidades, CES, el GB, hemos revisado la integración de la información de las páginas de especies y ampliado el contenido y el tipo de información proporcionada por el Atlas de la Biodiversidad de Costa Rica, uno de los portales de la comunidad de Living Atlas. El explorador de información sobre biodiversidad o módulo BIE maneja datos taxonómicos y contenido de especies asociados a la taxonomía, por ejemplo, estados de conservación, descripción, multimedia, datos genéticos y literatura, y los datos asociados a las descripciones de especies provenientes de Wikipedia y EOL. Adicionalmente, este módulo, por medio de gráficos y estadísticas, brinda acceso a los datos de presencia disponibles en el portal datos genéticos del GenBank e información de referencias bibliográficas del DHL asociados a la información taxonómica. En las próximas diapositivas vamos a presentarles algunos de los cambios realizados al módulo BIE para generar datos adicionales a la información taxonómica por medio de herramientas como el IPT y el modelo de datos PIN-Core, de forma tal que esos datos puedan ser indexados también en el portal y accedidos de forma integrada a través de la interfaz del portal. Sí. La arquitectura del módulo BIE está formada por tres módulos importantes eh, relacionados con datos de especies, como son el módulo BIE Index, que permite indexar el contenido de archivos de algún core archive en una base de datos sola y provee acceso por medio de servicio web a datos. El BIE Plugin que implementa una interfaz de usuario estándar para acceder a los datos incorporados en Solar y el ALA BIE que se basa en el BIE Plugin y permite personalizar la funcionalidad y la interfaz de usuario de acuerdo a las necesidades del país. La arquitectura del módulo BIE está en proceso de reestructuración. Lo que es hoy el BIE Plugin y el ala BIE serán integrados en un único módulo llamado ala BIE. Este cambio aún no está incorporado en los scripts de instalación del portal, por lo que por ahora trabajamos en los módulos ala BIE y BIE Plugin. El repositorio de Solar fue extendido en este proyecto para incluir términos del PLIC, por ejemplo, lo que se muestra en la diapositiva: lenguaje, sinónimos, descripción completa, ciclo de vida, reproducción, alimentación, datos moleculares, hábitat, entre otros. El importador de datos de Arduin Core Archive, incluido en el BIE Index, permite procesar datos asociados a taxones por medio de extensiones. Por ejemplo, se pueden adicionar datos como nombres comunes y referencias bibliográficas de descripciones taxonómicas y como parte de este proyecto, agregamos funcionalidad para procesar los datos disponibles en las extensiones del cliente. Aquí les mostramos algunas de las modificaciones que realizamos en los módulos del ALA. El BIE Index, por ejemplo, requirió de varios cambios para que acepte la estructura del Pinian Core que se indexa en SOLAR. Estos cambios deben realizarse en el código fuente de los lenguajes Ruby y Java utilizados en la plataforma Grails, la principal del ALA. Los que ven en la pantalla son algunos de los términos de la extensión simple del Pinian Core, los cuales deben ser especificados en varias secciones del código. En el caso del ALA BIE, que funciona como capa de presentación o front-end, los cambios tienen que ver sobre todo con la adición de nuevos campos para el despliegue de los datos. 
Estos pueden ser campos de texto o eventualmente también de tipo multimedia, como imágenes, por ejemplo. En cuanto al trabajo futuro, hay algunas tareas como corrección y revisión de los enlaces del BIE con otros módulos. Por ejemplo, el BioCache, que es el que se encarga de los registros de presencia. También la traducción a varios idiomas de las etiquetas correspondientes a los campos del PIN en Core, así como la inclusión de datos de fuentes adicionales como guías de campo y floras. Y por último, pero muy importante, la ratificación de la extensión del PIN en Core en el IPT. Para más información, le recomendamos visitar los recursos que ofrecen el Sistema de Información sobre Biodiversidad de Brasil, el proyecto CESP 2020-006 y también el sitio web del estándar Linencore. Por último, los autores queremos agradecer a las siguientes instituciones, la Infraestructura Mundial de Información en Biodiversidad y su programa de apoyo a la mejora de capacidades el Sistema de Información sobre la Biodiversidad de Brasil, la Comunidad de los Living Atlases, el Instituto Nacional de Biodiversidad de Costa Rica, el Jardín Botánico de Missouri y el Atlas de la Biodiversidad de Australia. Muchas gracias. Thank you. We, we have time. We have time for questions. Good question from uh, Carlos Martinez. Uh, for the Plinian Core presenters, do you have an assessment of how much of the Plinian Core terms overlap with the species profile model? Description type, GB vocabulary. I see many repeated terms. Maybe we should aim at maintaining those three standards together. I can answer that. In uh, the Tabwe meeting of uh, 2017, we did an assessment of um, how Plinian Core relates to other uh, Tabwe standards. So it is, it is there. I wouldn't say there is, of course, there is overlap in some terms, but is most of it is reducing of other terms for the purpose of um, recording and exchanging species information. Well, if we, we don't have any more questions, then we move on with the program and our next speaker will also be connecting remotely i don't know if he is recorded or he will present it live recorded he will I'll be doing live. this okay. live uh, excellent then uh though the floor is yours So, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Doug Palmer from the Atlas of Living Australia, and I'll be presenting what we call the Large Taxon Collider. Um, first off, I'd like to acknowledge the Nullawal and the Gumbri people as the traditional owners of the site I'm on and pay respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I'll just go over a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the first thing will be how the ALA uses taxonomy. Um, what we have to do for a variety of reasons is construct one as we go along, and I'll go through how we do that. And then discuss how things get messy and talk about a little bit of future work. Um, so how do we use taxonomy? Uh, our main business is occurrence records, and in particular, the what. We're not particularly precious about our taxonomy. Um, the purpose of it is to allow people to find the, the stuff they want. And the um, so we need to build one. We cover a very large range, and we have to use a number of authorities to cover each of the various sources. 
Uh, one of the main sort uses of it is in the BIA, which was just discussed before, and discovery. Uh, the other use we have for it is name matching. Um, this is a machine-oriented automatic processing. And what we need to do is be able to take occurrence records and then match them to our current taxonomy. And as you can see, anybody who saw Peggy's talk before, we've got the same here be dragons uh, talk there, and I'll talk about that. Just go on to building the taxonomy. And we have six major taxonomies that we use and a number of minor ones. All of these get pre-processed into a standard Darwin Core Archive format using a standard structure and a standard vocabulary before being pushed into a merging process called the Large Taxon Collider. This basically takes all the various taxonomies and squeezes them together along with a configuration which has a large number of rules and fixes and bits of metadata to provide a combined taxonomy which is consistent, we hope, and contains other things. The key part of that is building what we call name keys so that we can identify which taxa are similar. Uh, we can localize them to a certain extent and construct them out of the various components we've got below. Then when we do that, we start looking for something called a primary taxon. So this is the one out of all the various options we've got where we can actually choose to say, this is the one we're going to be talking about from now. And we construct a number of levels of this going up with less and less and less useful information as we go along. So at the bottom, we've got various ones and then we go in. The way we do this is a process called resolution. And so we start with a number of sources. They all have parent-child relationships using various forms and we're not too fussy about what kind of form the input provides. We then resolve those so that they actually go onto a um, single parent and a single choice for what the taxonomy is. We do the same thing with synonyms. It's a bit more complicated because we can provide things which are multiple synonyms, but the end result is a single con consistent taxonomy. And the way we do this is by a process called scoring. Basically, we take each individual taxon and we build a score out of it. The major component of the score is the source. We have preferences for what is an authority and what isn't, but we can also adjust it for things like taxonomic status or nomenclatural status or various other things so that we can come up with what we prefer and what we don't. Now I'll now get on to where this all gets horribly messy. The first thing, is that we have something which everybody contributed to and nobody actually wanted in the first place. Um, it's been described as a Franken taxonomy uh, because it's all little bits of stuff stitched together in horrible ways. And it tends to show up all kinds of unfortunate results. Uh, we haven't managed to take in re regional expectations uh, particularly well. And over time, we've discovered that scoring is a really bad way of expressing the rules that we have for how things work. Um, they just get more and more complicated and you do more and more fiddly things describing the rules as you go along. We've also got a large number of practical problems which are associated with that. Uh, one of the things which absolutely stunned me was that there are disagreements in our sources about even what kind of nomenclature or codes we have in the, um, we have for various things. So is Christmas an animal or plant? I don't know. Our various sources say everything. We have all kinds of disagreements about ranks, um, strange placeholder names. We have to pull in implicit taxonomies, um, strange synonym loops and all kinds of variant spellings and try and mush these together to produce a result. Unfortunately, this leads to a large number of complications because we have to do everything as a single process. We're trying to do this without human intervention as much as possible. 
And so we have a configuration file, which has just grown and grown and grown as we introduce more and more rules and make more and more adjustments to deal with various issues. Uh, the other practical issue we have at the moment is that um, the LA taxonomy runs to about 750,000 instances of various things, and we can run the whole thing in memory. Um, putting the NCBI in breaks it, and so does the full catalogue of life. So we'll go from there. I'll just say a few words now about what we have planned for the future. Um, the first one is improvements to the name matching system. Uh, at the moment, we're using the same algorithms we used pretty much at the start of the ALA. They've grown into being a large collection of heuristics and various things. And what I've been doing over the past three or so years is taking this back and starting to look at a really um, consistent way of providing name matching. And what we're going to be using is a method based on Bayesian analysis, where we regard the data coming in in the record as vector of possibly inconsistent evidence. And we try and find the hypothesis, which is the taxon, which matches that the best. Um, to do that, we build something called a Bayesian network. And I'll just show you that in a moment. So the other thing we need to do to make this work is include distribution information, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, been building a model using the same Bayesian network system to actually tie various Darwin core terms to identifying localities. And you can see the, um, the inference model for that on the right-hand side and match those against the Getty thesaurus of geographic names so that we can match incoming records with the distribution information contained in various things. That's still an ongoing area of work because certain sources like Catalogue of Life use marine regions or the TAPWIC uh, terms for localities, um, just working to get that in and working. The other thing we're um, doing more is including proper references from the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Nicole gave a talk about that before, but what we want to be able to do is push reference information from the very start all the way through this merging process so that stuff, proper references with DOIs and so on, get attached to the, uh, to the actual taxon properly. And at that particular point, even though my slides seem to want to run on ahead of me, I'll say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Thank you, Bill. Questions? Do we have anyone in question in chat, William? Vincent. Thanks. That's really interesting. Um, Vince Smith, NHM London. How close are you to the, having that kind of Bayesian probabilistic approach working? Is that actually a theoretical thing or is that in operation? No, it's now? a completely practical thing. And I can actually put the uh, link to the GitHub repository where it's done in the code at the moment. Um, I have it working perfectly for, or as perfectly as a probabilistic model can be for um, for things without distribution. But uh, the um, I'm still working through the distribution and locality issues at the moment. Um, I've got it working with the Getty thesaurus of uh, names, but one of the things I realised is that um, it doesn't work quite the way I expected it to. And um, having to introduce more information from the catalogue of life has meant that I've had to in engage with marine regions vocabulary at the same time, and they're not very compatible. Um, there's, uh, I'll put the GitHub um, repository into the chat or the, the Slack channel for people to have a look at if they want to. 
Um, that's currently going to be transferred over to the Atlas of Weather in Australia at some point. But um, it's at the stage where I'm running through samples of 100,000 different um, examples, sorry, 10,000 different examples of data drawn from the Atlas, the raw data from the Atlas, and getting reasonable results um, in terms of matching. Uh, it can be a little bit more picky than the current one, but the, the aim is to stop it categorizing beetles as flowers and things like that, just as much as it is to actually get a get a match. match. Yes, I guess that's always the danger is that if you, it's not the obvious mistakes, or it's, it's actually the obvious mistakes that probably will be the ones that you'll get screamed at most at. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can think of our own challenges trying to implement something like this. Anyway, that's great. Well, I will I, definitely look at that. Code. I often say that I get some um, emails with bite, bite marks on them. Thank you. More questions? I don't see any. Do we have any? Okay, then if not, our next presentation uh, is about seeing species, a linked data application to explore taxonomic names. Do we have any of the authors present in the room? because we haven't been able to okay the presenter okay so no one for presenting sign species um and the, the following and last one of this session the title is an algorithmic approach to reducing taxonomic detail from actual data sets on the metadata representation to increase findability. The presenter listed in the program is Cedric Decu. Is he in the room? Is any one of the authors of this contribution in the room? Okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I will not be in the room, but uh, I'm in the the zoom call and i should also have a presentation uh, video where are we having sorry who is uh, speaking yes uh, cedric here Excellent. okay then are, are you ready to present uh yes let me get the presentation now. Uh, yes, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, first things first. Do you guys uh, see the screen? Yes. Okay, uh, then I will begin. Uh, my name is Dick Louis Hedrick. Uh, I'm an open science officer at the Flanders Marine Institute, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, an algorithmic approach to reduce taxonomic detail from actual data sets in their metadata representation to increase findability. Uh, first things first, what is data management? Well, according to the latest definition, data management is a process of ingesting, storing, organizing, and maintaining data for which there are processes that include a combination of different functions that collectively aim to make sure that your data is accurate, available, accessible, and findable. Uh, today, I will be focusing on the last one, findability. Um, I will do so by going over the problem at hand and then explaining how we tackle this problem, uh, show you a workout an example uh, of what we did, and then lastly, explain in more details what we will be doing in the future. Uh, but first, the problem at hand. Um, the rise for more fair data is being answered by increasingly automated ways of capturing, processing, publishing, and registering biodiversity data sets. This, in tandem with the increasing possibility for detecting hundreds of species in a single event, and uh, for this, I'm looking at eDNA uh, samples, uh, results in taxonomic information that is multiple levels of magnitude higher 
than it was a few years ago. Uh, this spike in content uh, had an adverse effect on the ability of, for researchers to find relevant data sets within catalogs. Uh, this is due to the limitation in storing, displaying taxonomic data. So I'm looking at the real estate uh, for web pages, uh, sunburst charts that cannot be uh, uh, shown properly, etc. And also the time frame that is required for uh, a server to fetch information uh, and display it properly to the front end in a comprehensible uh, way. Uh, before we go uh, into the problem solving, I would like to explain a few terms uh, that I'll be throwing around in the presentation. Uh, the first one of this is the World Registry of Marine Species, or WORMS, which is a taxonomic uh, backbone that provides species information. Um, this uh, information is provided uh, to the Integrated Marine Information System, or IMIS, which is an in-house metadata catalog for marine data which is also by itself a metadata catalog of the European Node uh, of the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, or EUROBIS. Uh, this taxonomic information is added to these metadata records in IMIS by, by WORMS Persistent Identifiers, or PIDs. We call them OFIDs in-house. Uh, the tension between providing all the taxonomic metadata while not overloading the catalog itself uh, is the use case here. And for our uh, approach, we use a filter and replace algorithm. This technique reduces the detailed taxonomic information of actual occurrences in the data set, uh, content into practical good enough metadata. It takes uh, as input uh, of all the data sets, uh, wait, it takes as input all the species in the data set along with their hierarchical structure, as well as a configuration parameter that allows for upper bound uh, limits uh, for the acceptable number of taxa. In the image here, we can see the relationship between FIDs. Um, there will always be one root, and uh, this root will have uh, child nodes. So there will be, uh, for all uh, our data sets, there will be biota as a root. And then we go uh, to their children. And the levels that you see here. Uh, will be the rank of the taxonomy, being species, genus, and uh, kingdom. The core principle of the algorithm is to start off with a minimal result set, um, like, it's like, like I said, only the root, and I will gradually triple down uh, to his children to see uh, if these can be uh, replaced. So as I said, the parameters will be the number of FEIDs to keep, minimum taxonomic level that you want to reach and a maximum taxonomic level that you want to reach. The workflow for this is we start at the root. For instance, uh, we have this tree, which has uh, six uh, maximum uh, nodes that it can reach, but say that we, for instance, want only three of them. So we start at the root and we check um, if uh, the number of children is uh, greater than the number of children we want to keep, so the number of children that we have here is three, and the number of children we want to keep uh, is also three. So that's OK. So it will replace uh, node A by node B, C, and D. And then it will uh, go over it again and check if the nodes, uh, if the number of child nodes for a node um, goes over the threshold of the maximum number of nodes to keep. So for B, uh, it goes over because four is greater than three, so it will keep B. For C, it will keep um, uh, go to the child uh, G. So this one will be replaced. And for D, uh, it will uh, not be replaced either. This approach ensures that uh, no coverage is lost, meaning every taxon in the actual data set is represented in the result, although uh, possibly by its parents. So by nature, it will go down to the lowest relevant detail without challenging the upper bound limit. A worked out example uh, of this uh, is the Macrobentos data of Shoreham, uh, which has 646 FIIDs, and I had to reduce this to 48. Um, it's uh, a bit difficult to visualize, but uh, I tried to do it with a tree map. 
for this, you can see that the uh, most outer bound box, uh, the gray one biota, encompasses all the species within, and then it goes uh, down in rank. So uh, you see that uh, in biota, there's animalia, and so on and so forward. And uh, for example, uh, I hovered here over uh, Eriantria, which is a uh, subclass and which has the uh, parent polychaeta. You can also see that there is a children's reduced uh, number. This is the amount of uh, AFIA IDs that it has reduced by using the algorithm. The red boxes uh, in the stream map represent the AFIA IDs that were present uh, in the beginning, but were filtered out. And the blue boxes are the AFIA IDs that were not given in the beginning, but are present in the end. And the pink ones are the AFIA IDs that were given in the beginning and were also present in the end, so not filtered out. Now, this is a um, difficult representation to understand. So I made a bar chart, which um, for the horizontal axis, uh, displays the rank percentage of uh, the total of the IDs. And then the Y axis has uh, the rank class. Um, so in the before uh, sections so of before filtering, we see that there is a lot of percentage of species present. So a lot of uh, details. Uh, but after the filtering, we see that this is, has been significantly reduced and uh, that the AFI IDs have been moved to a higher rank, uh, sort of genus and class. But that still all the uh, IDs that were given before all the taxonomies are still uh, represented by the final IDs. Alongside uh, of for future possible endeavors, uh, we aim to make a custom Python library for executing a uh, set algorithm uh, in collaboration with the scientists uh, who need this and for the data centers who need this. Um, there will also be, alongside the basic um, filter and replace algorithm, there will also be advanced functionalities such as uh, pruning based on different categories, such as habitat, traits, and geolocation. And also, instead of uh, the taxonomies themselves, also the species occurrences and data sets. But um, note that by using this uh, pruning, uh, we will departure from the full coverage guarantee that was mentioned earlier. So it can be that not all the species in your data set will be represented in the end uh, if you would use uh, occurrences. Um, yeah, I would like to acknowledge uh, Vliss and also my uh, fellow uh, colleagues who have worked uh, on this presentation with me. And um, I would like to give the floor to the people uh, who have any questions for me. Um, thank you for listening. That was it for me. Thank you. Time for questions. Well, while you make up your minds, uh, I have a I have a question, Cedric. Yes. Uh, how I mean, in proportion, how much uh, human expertise is needed in that process, and how much is, is done by automatic algorithm? Uh, well, first, um, all the AFI IDs are already present in the data set, so the only thing I needed to do is get the hierarchical structure out of them, and then. Only a few parameters were needed to uh, do the filtering. So not very much human expertise, but um, I don't think I understood the question um, that well. What do you mean then by human expertise on the part of... Um, that everything is done just looking at the, at the names and how they can be nested in higher up in the hierarchy with yes. no expertise saying, okay, this taxon and this other taxon are the same, not, nothing of that sort. No, nothing of that sort. It's uh, only the uh, algorithm that does that. It moves them back to a higher taxonomy. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the room? I don't see any. Any questions in the chat? Excuse me. Yes. Um, maybe just as a small nuance to Cedric's uh, response a minute ago, 
the expertise is actually embedded in the worms catalog already eh? so the 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 organization of the taxa is in is in is inside worms and the algorithm taps into that knowledge as well so maybe that clarifies a bit better where the question was aiming at thank you can you introduce yourself so it can be recorded Yes, sorry. My name is Mark Portier. I'm uh, uh, in the same team as uh, Cedric. Thank you. With this, we, we move into the, the last part of our session. So if you have any question or comment to any of the presenters of uh, this morning, either in the first part of the session or in the second, this is the, the time. And I assume as well that uh, we have any author from the, the presentation that we are missing as well. So that takes us to uh, an early closing of this session. Thank you very much. For all the presenters, to the technical team, and to you for your participation. Thank you.